friends. I call our morning 9.15 business session to order. If we can please make our way to our seats. We are going to begin our morning with prayer in just a few moments. I do want to remind the House that we've, we've done very well all week and getting our work done. And today we have a very full agenda and we will get our work finished today, amen? amen. And it is our goal to stay on schedule and I am going to do my best to keep us on schedule and I thank you for being so gracious as you have been all week and cooperating with being here on time so we can get started on time. I see some of you are still making your way to your seats I'm gonna give you one more second to get seated so we can all be still as we open in prayer. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, amen. amen. Our last and final day for this 50th session of the East Ohio Annual Conference. We are going to begin in prayer and I am going to invite Darlene Robinson to come to open us in prayer. Thank you, Bishop. Good morning, everyone. Good and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, thanking you for the beauty of this day and giving you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord, we lift your name on high. Lord, it is evident that you have been with us this week, and so we pray for your continued presence. We pray especially for this day as we continue with our work together. We pray that what we do will give you all the glory. Please, Jesus, lead us and guide us as only you can. We pray that you would bind the enemy and keep him bound, especially throughout this day as we move into other business, as we still have work to do. Give us the shameless audacity, as I heard someone once say, the shameless audacity to be your people and to go out and tell everyone about Jesus. You are indeed majestic, you are indeed mighty, and you are indeed powerful and awesome. And we ask all these things according to your will and your way, that your will be done. And it is in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. And to God be the glory. Amen. Thank you, Darlene, for that prayer. Um, friends, as we begin this uh, morning, um, I want to take the opportunity, um, just a few moments ago, um, prior to the benediction, I shared some um, offering of thanks for those who have been instrumental in leading us in worship. Um, I also want to continue a, a moment of appreciation. We know it takes a team, an entire village, to work together um, to prepare us and to lead us through this annual conference. And let me just um, lift before the body these following persons who represent these different parts of our team that we might celebrate them. And just hold the applause until I finish. We want to thank our AV team. We want to thank our camera team. We want to thank our video and sound team, our Hoover stage crew. We want to thank all of our pages. And we want to thank Huey's production crew. Let us say thank you, Lord, for all of our communications and media team who work so hard. Amen. Amen. I want to recognize microphone number five. June Wagner from the Ohio Valley District. I am asking for a moment of personal privilege. You may proceed. Um, the 2019 Special Generous General Conference was bathed in prayer for God's will to be done. The Way Forward came up with three options for the Special General Conference to be voted on for a way forward. The councils of bishops who have taken an oath to uphold our Book of Discipline 
spoke out in support of our delegation for the special general conference to vote for the one church plan. The traditional plan was not even going to be brought before the special general conference to be voted on. The modified traditional plan was adopted by the 2019 special general conference. I believe God's will was done for the United Methodist Church. I do not understand why our leadership in East Ohio Conference, who has taken an oath to uphold our Book of Discipline, continue to speak so against our Book of Discipline in regards to sexual orientation. I have heard the words of integrity and accountability used by our conference leadership many times during this conference of East Ohio. I am asking for our leadership of our conference to instore integrity and accountability to the oath they have each taken before and to God. I am asking for our leadership of the East Ohio Conference to allow us to see in their leadership and to hear in their leadership the upholding of our Book of Discipline. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Friends, I have said before, and I'm going to say it again, when people speak, they're offering words from their heart, and we do not applaud, and we do not shame, and I'm going to ask that we keep to that covenant. Amen. Thank you for your sharing. Um, let me now call on our conference secretary, um, Cindy Patterson, who is going to give us some instructions as we prepare for ballot number six. Friends, thank you. We did an incredible job yesterday. And in the words of a wise man this week, you are a better annual conference than we deserve to serve. And you proved that well in your diligence and your attention to the work of the conference yesterday. So thank you very much. So we proceed with um, our next ballot. We will be collecting the clergy ballot first. Um, a reminder that the invalid ballots continue to be persons who are voting outside of the range. For laity, the range is number 25 through number 84. For clergy, the range is 001 through 779. So please, don't assume that you are in the range. Take a look at the numbers you're marking and make sure that you're falling within that range. Also, pay close attention to the numbers that will be on the screen. Those are the persons you have so diligently already elected. Don't vote for them again because that will invalidate your ballot. So we're voting for fewer people. You have a little bit more breathing space in the time. Take the time to make sure that you are um, paying attention to those details and so that your ballot will be counted and will be valid. For the clergy, um, with the elections that were reported last night, you will be voting for one person. Your ballot code is no, N-O. Your teller group will be B. For the laity, you will be voting for four persons. Your ballot code is mayflies, M-A-Y. F-L-I-E-S, and your teller group will also be B. Okay, we have received those instructions. I do ask that we hold off on marking our ballots until I open the ballots, the process. Um, let us have prayer. Um, Terrell McCann is scheduled to offer a prayer today, and you are going to microphone number seven. If you'll please pray for us. I invite you to pray with me. Dear God, we thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you for this East Ohio Annual Conference, for the work that we have been able to do for your greater glory. I ask that you let us go into this ballot knowing that this is not for us, but this is for you so that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in his name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Ballot number six is open. You may proceed. When your ballot is complete, remember only clergy are standing. Only clergy are standing. When you have completed your ballots, if you would stand. Okay, let me test the house. If you're needing more time, if you will please raise your hand. Raise your hand high so I can see if you need more time. Okay, right over here. All other tellers, if no one's hand is raised near you, you may go ahead and take your places. It looks like all tellers, okay, over here, thank you. Okay, looks like we're almost ready. I'm seeing no more tellers on the floor. So all ballots have been collected. Therefore, clergy ballot number six is closed. Laity, when you are ready and have your ballots completed, you may stand. I do ask that while we're in the midst of a balloting process that there's no movement except for that of the tellers and those persons standing. That helps me get a sense of our readiness. Laity, needing more time, if you can raise your hand so I can make sure that a teller comes near you. Any laity needing more time? All 
I'll give a chance for the tellers to make their way forward to submit their ballots. It looks like all ballots are over here. Thank you. Okay, it looks like all ballots are in. Amen. I am closing ballot number six for the laity. Friends, as we prepare to uh, move into our time of our vision segment number three, um, which is reaching new, younger, and more diverse people, and before I call on Gwen Avery, who is the president of the Conference Council on Youth Ministries to introduce this segment, I'm gonna invite us together to sing There's a Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Let us be in prayer. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know, and I know that is the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions. There are sweet expressions on each face and I know that it's the presence of the Lord sweet Holy Spirit sweet heavenly dove Lord, stay right here with us. Filling us with your love. And for these blessings. We lift our hearts. And without a doubt, When we Amen. Microphone number five. I would like to, uh, Charles Stellick, East Ohio Conference Church of the Redeemer, United Methodist. I'd like to request a moment of privilege, please. Okay, I am I'm gonna invite you to come back to the mic after the vision segment because we're gonna go live at a certain time and I need to be able to keep us on schedule. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let me now call Gwen Avery, who's gonna come and introduce vision segment number three. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Gwen Avery and I serve on the Conference Council on Youth Ministries. As we begin this vision segment, I would invite you to return to page 111 so that you may take notes for future use. This week, we've heard some amazing examples of bearing fruit that lasts by maturing as disciples and by being agents of transformation in our community and through all the world. Today, as we focus on how we can be intentional in reaching new people, younger people, and more diverse people. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for all people. Let's turn our attention to Will Jones as we hear how one church is being bold and courageous in reaching young people like me. Good morning, people of God. Glad to know you're awake this morning. Well, my name is Will Jones. I'm your director of Multicultural Vitality, and part of my role is to help build relationships across difference so that we can be in ministry together. I'm here with my friend, Laura White, who's gonna share how her church has been 
reaching across difference and shifting the way it does ministry so that it can be bold and courageous. Thanks for being here, Laura. Thanks, Will. Thanks for inviting me. Um, as Will said, my name is Reverend Laura White, and as you know, Will, I was reappointed last year to Ashland Community at Christ United Methodist Church. And one of the first things that I felt God calling us to was to be bold in our ministry to Ashland University students. And so after a lot of prayer and conversations with the leadership of our church, a miracle happened. One Sunday in early September, eight Ashland University students showed up at church. Now those AU students continue to be actively involved in our church and coming to Sunday school because our congregation was committed to building relationships with them by inviting them into our existing older adult Sunday school class and building those one-on-one -on -one relationships. Matter of fact, one of my Sunday school class members who is actually out there somewhere um, came up to me a few months after they started attending and he said, you know what, Pastor Laura, you were right. They like being with us old people and they make us feel younger. Wow, that's amazing. So one step that you took to be bold and courageous was shifting the way you thought about intergenerational ministry. You just loved on these college students. What other ways has your church reached these students? Well, one of the things we recognized immediately is that we have several um, in the age group from 18 to 30, but they don't fit in that one size fits all box. They come from all different walks of lives. We have young families with children. We have young single parents. We have young single working adults. And we have a same-sex couple. What connects them to our church is the love that we give to them through building relationships, through Sunday school, through worship, through fellowship, through sending cards, and through just taking a bowl of chicken noodle soup to the dorm room when they're sick. <laughs> So we actually created this single space, and one of the things that comes to mind is we had a young single mom who came to me because she couldn't afford internet. So we invited her to come use the church's internet. So she brings her preschooler to the preschool room and does her classwork while there because it's a whole lot easier to get work done in the church with your child playing in the preschool than it is in the library. Wow, yeah. So, you know, Will, all of our AU students continue to be actively involved in the church. And a matter of fact, this past spring, when we brought 16 members into the church, three of our AU students also became members, one of which had never attended church as a child, and so I had the honor of baptizing her into the Christian faith. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much for the work your church is doing. Amen. Let me pray for you before you go, if we could pray. God, we thank you for this ministry in Ashland and pray that you would continue to bless it. Help us learn what it means to truly become and to truly welcome your children and to shift our priorities to love one another. Amen. Let's thank Laura for sharing how her ministry is doing. As we think about reaching new people, younger people, and more diverse people, one of the best points of connection we can make is through existing ministries and existing relationships we have with families. Many of our churches house daycares and preschools. Raise your hand if you're one of those churches. We offer a safe place to care for children, but are we also offering discipleship opportunities? Let's take a moment to hear from one church in New Philadelphia and Create a Fish Preschool who's doing this. As you watch this video, ask yourself, how are they engaging parents and young families in their community? My name is Jamie Baker, and I serve as the director of Create a Fish Preschool, and I have been blessed to be a part of the preschool since 2012. Create a Fish is first and foremost a ministry of the church. The mission of First United Methodist Church is making and maturing disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, and Creative Fish Preschool shares that mission. We focus on creating a classroom community of respectful, responsible, and caring children. Our name stands for a strong desire to be a creative outlet for our kids while we are faithful in serving Him. What I love most about being the director here is not only seeing the growth and development that takes place in the children, but forming a relationship with them. That relationship extends to the families as well. 
We have made so many connections within the church and with his teachers and other parents and children. And we have seen huge improvements just in his demeanor. And he loves making friends in church and outside of the classroom now too. The outside classroom is our favorite part as well as theirs because it gives them the room and opportunity they need to play and create and explore. And so they really have entered into kindergarten you know, not only ready, but excited. They really now have an understanding that they're coming to school for a purpose, that is they're going to learn, and then they're going to go on to another school at some point in time, and then from that school, maybe college if they so decide, and that will ultimately lead to a job. And they got that from going to the bank and to the library and even to the ice cream shop at certain times, um, and also with the people who come in and work with them from day to day. I think the biggest thing, though, that they've taken away about a community is just how to be kind to others and how to participate with others and to be kind to their friends. Probably the most important thing for me as his mother, that he can come here and feel like he can be himself. And his friends that he has made here also embrace in his different character and different personality as well. He likes wind socks and balloons and things like that, but other little boys like playing with cars and that's okay. And little girls like to play with Barbie dolls and some little girls like to play with cars and that's okay too. And I think that that's really helping him understand what you know being different and growing up is about. The church ministers to the parents and kids of the preschool by first and foremost caring for the children and teaching and leading as much as possible each individual unique child. We also share and join events between the church and preschool to develop a stronger relationship together. We host a Christmas program and offer scholarships and help with supplies and other needs. We strive to create a space for kids to grow, learn, and be creative. The most important impact we have in our community is helping the children develop a solid foundation for life. They grow in social and motor skills as well as creativity. We are also introducing and showing God's love to our students as well as their families. And that is how we are reaching new, younger, and more diverse people. In East Ohio are engaged in vital ministry, like Creative Fish, and it's been inspiring to hear how one church is reaching new people in their community. Each year, we demonstrate God's faithfulness by supporting the Black College Fund and our historic black colleges and universities across the United States. These institutions were created at a time when people of color, especially African Americans, were not welcome in many, many colleges and universities. We commit to continue to repent for that period of time, and we commit to continue to support these colleges and universities. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Cedric Dokes from Philander Smith College. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. Good morning to the bishop, the cabinet, and the entire East Ohio Annual Conference. I bring you greetings on behalf of Dr. Cynthia Bond Hobson, Assistant General Secretary of the Black College Fund for Ethnic Concerns. Today, I'm here to tell you of how my story in the Black College Fund and United Methodist Church has positively changed my life. School was a problem that I encountered and tried to handle on my own and found that my way was not the correct way. My senior year, I had gotten into an altercation at school and because of the rules and regulations that they had in place, I was dismissed from that institution and sent back to my formal school. Here I was, a senior in high school, not sure if I would graduate and clearly not seeing college as a possibility. I know you're probably thinking, wow, is this reality? Well, yes, it was my everyday life. I was thinking, how am I going to be able to tell my mother that I'm not going to graduate on time? When I broke the news to her, she did not have the spirit of fear, but the presence of faith and told me to seek God and he would direct my path. I'm standing here today to tell you that I did walk across that stage on time and receive my high school diploma. I am a living witness that God may not come on our time, but he is always right on time. 
When I arrived at Philander Smith College, I was a part of the largest class which caused on-campus housing to be unavailable. The Black College Fund stepped in and helped support Philander's housing issues by giving money for additional housing called Panther Village. This act of urgency and kindness rendered by the Black College Fund gave me and more than 50 students a home at Philander Smith College. Later, the president needed assistance at the Arkansas Annual Conference in 2018 and invited me to attend and help the chaplain. This allowed me the opportunity to serve, to network, and build positive relationships that will last forever. One of those relationships gave me the opportunity to become the executive assistant to the chaplain of Philander, Reverend Ronnie Miller Yao. My relationship with Christ has grown much stronger, and this has allowed me to receive many blessings. And a major blessing is happening right now as I stand before you today, Alina H. McCord intern. God has truly smiled upon me. The United Methodist Church believes in helping and serving and paying it forward. You all are a beacon of hope and a bright light for so many people. The United Methodist Church and the Black College Fund continues to give me and 15,999 other students hope, help, and happiness. Your good works are worthy to be praised. East Ohio Annual Conference, you have paid 100% of your apportionments this year, and I salute your efforts. Please give yourselves a round of applause. As I leave you today, I am reminded of what Jesus said in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. East Ohio Annual Conference, I want to thank you for all of your support, your contributions, and your prayers. Have a blessed day. Amen. 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 If something you have heard today stirs something within you and you want more information, do not hesitate to email me at willj at eocumc.com. As we celebrate reaching young people, new people, more diverse people in many different ways, let's welcome back the Reverend Dr. Powell to talk about leadership in these changing times. Good morning, East Ohio. Good morning. It's good to say good morning. I've said good afternoon the past few days, so it's good to be with you in the morning. Let us have a word of prayer together. Gracious God, may your spirit dwell in this space with us. May we truly feel your presence as we continue to do your work. Help us to touch the lives, particularly of young people. Help us to make those connections that will make a difference in their lives. We ask now that you would anoint everyone under the sound of my voice, to truly be your followers. We ask this in your son's precious name, amen. Let me uh, do a couple of housekeeping things first. I've uh, received a few emails and had people ask about the PowerPoint slides. Uh, the PowerPoint slides will be available to you on the website is my understanding. So you will be able to download the PowerPoint slides off of the East Ohio website. So they will be made available to you. So um, those will be coming. Um, the second is they're gonna put up a photo of a handout that is on the back um, table there, um, just uh, real quickly. And again, this handout is from the resource that I talked about on Monday, and there will be another little clip from it a little bit later in my presentation. But if you want to fly her again, um, because you are in the greatest state that there is in this union, Ohio, <laughs> you will get a 20, it is the greatest. I tell people that all the time. <laughs> yes. uh, you get a 25% discount, so, um, and it, there's a code on that sheet, so it's on the back table. So. Please pick up the sheet if you're interested in that resource. Having said that, let us get started for today. And if we could please uh, put up what would be slide three. Excellent. 
Um, today we're going to talk about reaching um, younger people in particular. And want to set some background information uh, in terms of generations. We could really talk about this all morning long because it's really fascinating work. Strauss and Howe are the two individuals who sort of spearheaded this effort and this work. And if you ever, they have a book that's like this thick that goes through uh, several generations. I'm going to talk about four of their generations um, in particular and how those generations have sort of impacted where we are in the church today. So if we begin and we think about the silent generation and the dates you see, 1921 and 1940, represent when someone is born. So if you were born between 1921 and 1940, you would be in the silent generation. And the silent generation is critically important because it is the silent generation that represents the generation when many people think of the heyday of the church. And the heyday of the church, um, in most cases, is usually the 50s and typically somewhere between the early to mid 60s. Um, the silent generation is the generation that came out of World War II and church became critically important for them. A few of the characteristics of the silent generation is the silent generation was very structured. The silent generation really um, did a lot of their work in meetings with one another, um, particularly meetings at the church. The silent generation, um, particularly at that point in time, was a male pastor. And we'll talk about it in a little bit. Women at this point weren't ordained in the United Methodist Church. Um, the silent generation was really sort of, when we think of the church, we sort of point to that heyday. What is sort of fascinating is during that time frame, we really did not do evangelism. Our churches were growing because people were going to the church because one, we were coming off of two world wars, and secondly, because the church at that point in time really was the social place to belong. So it wasn't that somehow our congregations were greatly involved in evangelism, but they were growing really because folk naturally were going to the church. So the silent generation is that generation that sort of represents the heyday of the church. The next uh, group are the, uh, the boomers. And the boomers um, are critically important because the boomers, of course, are the largest generation. They, that's the way they get their name from the boomers. And for the boomers, a couple of things are important. The boomers are the age group where we start to see a little bit of a shift. This language of spiritual but not religious starts taking place with the boomers. And that phrase is sort of stuck with us from that time period up to today. And you hear a lot more people using that language. It's during 1955, we finally had the ordination of women. So this takes time during the place that the boomers are born. What is fascinating is that many boomers sort of moved away from the church. But today, boomers are actually coming back to the church. Um, so it's fascinating that as we're reaching out to younger people, boomers, of course, are now um, maturing. We'll say, we're not saying they're getting old. We'll say boomers are maturing. Uh, that the boomers are an age group that actually are coming back to the church in a higher percentage probably than any other age group at this time. So the group that sort of stayed away from the church are finally returning to the church for the first time. So, so that's a picture of the boomers. The next um, group is Generation X. And Generation X is born between 61 and 80. And what is actually interesting is although we, though we use the term Generation X, if you actually look at the original work by Strauss and Howe, they call it the 13th generation. And the reason they call it the 13th generation is they said this generation had no hope. So they said, we're not even going to give it a name. We're just going to call it the 13th generation. Now, I'm a part of that generation. I took offense to that personally. <laughs> but 
you know, I didn't write it, so there wasn't much I could say. But this generation is one of the more fascinating generations in American culture. And it's fascinating because uh, this is sort of the height of the civil rights movement. Um, and it's during this time that, depending on where you lived, you could experience busing. So someone could live in one neighborhood, but get bused to a school that could be an hour to two hours away um, as they were trying to figure out how to create equality in the school systems. This is the generation that experienced uh, white flight. So you had individuals that would live in communities, and then African Americans would move into the community, so they would move out further to the suburbs, and then more African Americans would move in, and you would have people moving out further and further. So this generation is the generation that experienced white flight. One of the things that happened because of white flight is individuals that may have gone to church in a community that was located in one place were no longer living in that community, so they were driving back into church. This means they were no longer participating in the life of that community. So the churches started to be disengaged from their communities. Typically, people might come in on Sunday, and if you were fortunate, they may come in on a Wednesday for a Bible study, but that was it. So we started to see our churches and individuals going to those churches in some way become disengaged. And this had a profound impact on why we're where we are today, where many of our communities no longer connect with the churches because people started driving into these communities. So this starts taking place during that sort of time of Gen Xers. This is also the time where you see a rise in sort of non-denominational congregations. So in the suburbs, as people started moving out away from the city, you had this rise in non-denominational congregations, and people who did not drive back in sometime to the city decided to go to a non-denominational church that was in their suburb. So they'd start popping up and increasing in much larger numbers. This is the point in time where you see women starting to come in ministry. So someone for the first time could go to a congregation and have a woman pastor. This would take place for Gen Xers. So you could actually have Gen Xers that their first pastor could have been a female pastor and not a male pastor. So that takes place during this time. The next group is the millennials. And for the millennials, many of them did not grow up in the church. Um, so this is probably the largest group that did not particularly grow up in the church itself, which again has a profound impact on our culture. So if you think about previously, even if someone didn't go to church all the time, they sort of understood church culture. But for the first time, you have a group of individuals that really don't understand church culture. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later and why that is important. Um, so this group did not grow up in the church. This group also, in some ways, is experiencing a cultural shift. If you think about, for many of us who were in the silent generation, boomer generation, and I would argue probably if you were born during the 1960s for Gen Xers, that we were educated and learned in a particular way. Let me provide a couple of examples. So in school, some of you remember this. We all sat in straight rows, right, facing the chalkboard. Teachers sat in front or stood in front and would lecture to you, and that was your learning style. You sort of think about that. My son, who went to school, they learn in these little communities where they sit together, you know, at desk in little communities with one another. And the teacher is in the midst of these little communities, and it seems chaotic. I ran away from the classroom and never volunteered because it was just way too disturbing for me. <laughs> but the way they learned was very participatory and engaging. They were engaging each other and they were engaging the teacher in a way that they were working with one another. They weren't in straight rows. 
They weren't being lectured to. They were listening to the teacher and each other as they learned. So this has been a very different style of how they have engaged one another, which again is critically important for when we think about church here in a few minutes. Another example is sort of with uh, technology. So with technology, you know, when cell phones first came out and I started using my cell phone, I dutifully read all of my instructions, how to turn it on, how to use it, what buttons to push, everything to do. Millennials, of course, don't do that for the most case. They pick up the phone, turn it on to start, playing with the phone itself. They learn by participating with the phone itself. So again, a very different way of engaging in the activity. It's not that you go by sort of an instruction manual, but you participate in the thing itself. Uh, again, so this is critically important, again, for how we think about church. So millennials then had a very different way of sort of thinking and engaging the culture than many of us that has sort of impacted the way that they have sort of been disturbed by the way some of the ways that we think about church occur. And one last little piece on this is because of the way they've learned in community and because of the way they've been very participatory, millennials also are very suspicious of sort of hierarchy um, and sort of a, a top-down model. So most of our churches, of course, are structured very hierarchical. This is true for almost all mainline congregations. So again, this becomes sort of a challenge when we think about the way that we're structured and the way that millennials have been sort of taught to share and participate with one another in information and construct meaning. So I wanted to provide that background because I think it sort of helps to understand generationally sort of how we've moved along to where we are um, with sort of a brief understanding. Let us now go to, well, let me say one more thing before we go to the next slide. For those people born in the year 2000 moving forward, they keep calling them different names. Gen Y, the I generation, um, so there's many names out there. Nothing has really stuck yet, so we don't know what that generation is gonna be called. We'll probably, in a few years, figure out exactly who that generation is, but I did wanna point out that I'm not ignoring that generation, but nothing has really stuck yet for that generation. Let us now begin with the next slide, uh, starting with lingo. So, I'm using um, my book, Not Safe for Work, that I wrote with uh, Jasmine Smothers, um, Not Safe for Church. We took the title from playing around with Not Safe for Work. And in the book, we use the Numbers 13 text with Caleb and Joshua. And if you remember in this text, um, they're sending out spies, and there's 12 spies. And 10 of the spies come back and say, there's just no chance, man. We're, we're, we're done. We should just pack our bags, go back home. You know, they're giants. We're going to get crushed. There's, there's, there's no hope for us. And Caleb and Joshua come back and give a very different report. They, they give sort of the minority report that says, you know, no, there is a possibility here. There is hope here. Um, and Caleb and Joshua are the only two that see possibilities where everybody else sees immediate defeat. And we play off of that to say that in many cases, our congregations act more like the 10 than it does the two, right? Many of our congregations, particularly when it comes to engaging young people, perceive no hope no possibility instead of seeing hope and possibility because we're afraid of engaging and doing things that would take us out of our comfort zone. And of course, oftentimes we say those famous words, you couldn't escape here without hearing them. We tried it once and it didn't work, right? We, all, we say that in all of our, we tried it once and it didn't work. But, but, the key is, is that we've got to be willing to see it from the perspective of the two and not from the perspective of the 10. Next slide, please. So in it, we had some fun. Don't get stuck so much on the uh, 
titles, because we did have fun with the titles, and we created the Ten Commandments to help us to engage young people. So the first commandment for engaging young people is, thou shall chill. Came from Moses, I promise you. Um, and chilling is in this case is not about being lazy, um, but it's about not taking ourselves so seriously. And what we're really after here is what is at stake for our congregations? What is at stake for our congregations? Mark 10, 23 um, says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. I believe we could turn that a little bit and say how hard it is for a congregation to let go of old ways and to move towards the future with confidence. How hard it is to wet, let go of old ways and move toward the future with confidence. And in letting go, oftentimes people get nervous. So do we have to let go of everything? No. We're not letting go of everything. There are core things we have to hold on to. But the challenge is sometimes we hold on to things that started for a particular reason and no longer serve a purpose today. You know, those are the things we need to let go of. And it can become challenging because we've been doing it that way for so long we forgot why we did it that way to start with. But they have nothing to do with us being holy or following God. It's just the way that we've done it at our particular congregation. So it's not a matter of letting go of core things. Let's go to the next slide, please. Beloit mindset list. This is a very important list. If you go to the bottom, you'll see there where it says the mindsetlist.com. Beloit College every year puts this list out, and this list is one of the most eye-opening lists that you can click on each year. What they do is for the entering class, so the class of 2022, which was born in the year 2000, they give you characteristics for that class to help you get a frame of mind for just sort of what that class has experienced. And what you quickly figure out is the starting point for younger people is so vastly different than most of us who are in here today that it becomes hard for us to really appreciate how we have to engage them in a different way because their frame of reference is so different. And I just put a few of the things from the list um, that were up there. So this was, was the first class born in a new millennium. They've always had Wikipedia, but not encyclopedias, right? Many of us remember encyclopedias. We used encyclopedias, you know, but they have Wikipedia. This is the one that got me. A visit to the bank is a rare event unless they're with their parents. A visit to the bank is a rare event unless they're with their parents. And as we think about that, that should give us pause and think about how it is we take up the offering, right? So that means that probably most people who are 35 and under or 40 and under don't have a checkbook. And if they don't have a checkbook, they can't write a check. <laughs> so if you're going to take an offering, offerings have to be taken in a way that people can give electronically or through other means because there would be no way for them to participate if that were not the case. So, I mean, it means that, again, we have to rethink the way that we do some of the normal activities that we've always taken for granted because their frame of reference is so very different than our frame of reference. Mass market books have always been available in ebook form. Um, films, films have always been distributed on the internet. So, so this just helps you to get sort of a frame of reference that our starting point for how we understand the world and move in our church is so very different from their starting point. And it's not, as it was said up here, that they don't want to engage with us, but that we have to understand their starting point is going to be very different, so we have to bridge the starting points. We can't make assumptions about what we know that they're automatically going to understand it 
or buy into it if we're not willing to make that bridge. Let's go to the next slide. And one of the places that I had to make this bridge was skateboarding. Um, it is no secret for anyone who's ever um, known me that I'm the hugest Ohio State Buckeye fan and a huge football fan. You know, I, I love football. Yeah, it, it is. I'm, and I'm expecting a national championship year from the Buckeyes, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> so I've always been and enjoyed football, played football when I was younger. And if anyone has been a part of football or played football, and you've been on a football field, particularly a practice, practice can be pretty intense. You know, coaches tend to be sometimes sort of yelling at players, saying some words we wouldn't use in church. You know, that does take place on a football field. You know, so it's a, this sort of high pressure intense thing. My son decided he wanted to skateboard, and I'm thinking, skateboarding, okay. So I went to the skateboard park, and again, it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. You know, I thought they were the laziest people who did nothing. They all sit around and talk to each other. And then one person would go and try a move, and others would look at them. And they would sort of talk again, and then the next person. And I'm thinking, what in the world are they doing? <laughs> How do you accomplish anything when you do this? But as I started paying more attention to what was taking place, they were actually very good at helping each other to develop their craft. They were actually practicing and accomplishing the goal of improving because they were working together as they did the moves and rode the skateboard and worked on the different things they were doing, but they just did it in a very different way than was accomplished on the football field, right? So what it taught me is certainly on the football field you can accomplish something in one way, but that doesn't mean there isn't another way to accomplish something. You know, skateboarding and the way they do it accomplishes the goal of helping you to improve your craft, but they get there very differently than most football coaches. It's a lesson we have to learn in the church. This is where we have to sort of let go and chill. We can accomplish things, but we don't necessarily have to accomplish the way we've always accomplished it. We can do it in a very different manner, and that's important for us to hold on to and learn. Next slide, please. The next commandment is thou shall not front. Here, what we have to be careful of is we fall into this trap of seeking a quick fix. You know, we, we've had, because of what has taken place and we start seeing decline, that what we want to have happen is we need a quick fix. So we just figure out what strategy or what program is going to work to solve our problem. The reality is we're not going to have a quick fix for young people engaging us in our congregations. When you've ignored doing something for a number of years, you're not going to solve the problem in one week, right? It's not going to happen. So this is going to be an effort that is going to take time and energy on our part to make sure that we are building those authentic relationships that were talked about up here on stage where we are authentically looking to connect with them. And the second piece of this is we have to make sure that we're paying attention to the people that God is sending us. In many cases, God is sending us people, but it's not the people that we're looking for. But well, we got to make sure that we're paying attention to the people God is sending us. God is sending us those individuals for a reason. Next slide, please. We can't be afraid of trying new things. When we try new things, certainly we can fail, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but we can't be afraid of trying new things. We also want to make sure that we don't come across like we have all the answers. We want to make sure that we're transparent. All of these things are critically important to younger people. There's no reason for us to believe that we have to have everything, and we can be honest and just say, that's something that we can learn together. Next slide, please. The third command is, thou shalt not trip. In this commandment, the key is conversations. And, and here I want to emphasize conversations. 
Young people are interested in conversations about very challenging topics. Doesn't mean we have to do agree on the topics, but we can't be afraid to discuss the topics. Too often in the church, if something is challenging, we want to ignore it and not have a conversation about it. If we would have conversations about it, even if we don't agree, it means that we're willing to at least have the dialogue. That's critically important, again, for young people. Let me briefly introduce, um, we're getting ready to play a, a really quick video for you. And I mentioned this yesterday, I wanted to talk about entry points for young people in our congregation. This relates to the generational categories that I was talking about before, that our focus has always sort of been on worship. But the reality is worship today is probably not the primary place where we're gonna connect with young people. Let's play the video and then I'll come back and uh, unpack it a little bit more. After someone has attended three times, invite them to take the next faithful step. Someone who has visited three times is likely to be experiencing the congregation as a place of belonging. But membership may not be the next faithful step for everyone, especially younger individuals. They may be looking for ways to deepen their faith before joining. So be prepared to offer several ways of moving forward, such as getting involved with a mission project, small groups, or a Bible study. So let me share a little bit more about that. And that again is from that resource, Be the Welcoming Church. So young people aren't as likely to connect to worship. When we do invite people, we typically are inviting people to worship. But if you remember again, millennials, for the most part, many of them are unfamiliar with church. And if you think about worship, worship is probably the most non-relational thing that we do in the church because is set up like our old school classes. You come, you sit, you face the person who's up front speaking, and you're listening. You're, it's not a very relational way of engaging people. And if you grow up in an atmosphere where you're used to participatory and engagement, worship is not the place where that takes place. So places where higher engagement takes place, first is sort of mission projects. And one of the um, things that has taken place today is most schools require, once you get to junior high school through high school, that almost in every state now um, in the US, you have to have so many community engagement hours uh, to graduate from high school. So they're building in this sort of uh, becoming good community individuals and young people. The wonderful thing about this is many congregations have things that would qualify for those community engagement hours. Some of the things you're doing, if you're doing feeding of the hungry, or if you have some sort of clothing closet, something of that nature, it's a place where young people can actually receive the community engagement hours. This is a place where you can start building authentic relationships with young people and connect with uh, the school system. So this is something that is built in naturally that we should be making sure we're making those connections within our particular area with the schools, with those mission projects. And there's other mission projects, of course, where you could connect with young people. But that's the first place, because they are being oriented to being mission first, mission is a natural place for us to connect with young people. Second place is affinity groups. And in terms of affinity groups, um, one of my Friends in Kansas City is a runner. They go out and run 10 miles every morning, and I think they're crazy because I'm just thinking, why would you do that to yourself? But, you know, there's probably some runners in here and do that, you know. Um, but what this person did, um, she's a pastor. She started a affinity group where they would do devotion with one another, and have a little study and then run together 
for their 10 miles and dis sort of discuss the word. And that became a way for individuals who were not in church to get connected with her and the church. So affinity groups are another way to connect with people that would now naturally step into our church and to build those relationships. And again, it takes creativity. Another individual in Florida started a canoe group. He realized that many of the people near his church, there was water, were canoeing and not actually coming to church. So after he did his regular service, he started a canoe ministry and he was able to connect with the people who were out there on the water. So we have to be creative and think about ways that we can, again, go to the people and connect with them and not expect them to come to us. And of course, a third way is a small group. And small groups can take place, coffee shops, restaurants, any place that you could think of that you could think of holding small groups where people can come together and engage with one another that, again, is not as frightening as coming to a worship service. The point is, is that we have to think about entry points for people to connect with us that are not based on them coming to worship service, but are based on us going to them and making that initial connection. I want to take, although I know my time is running short, but I want to take, because I think this, this piece is critically important. If you get nothing else from the day, this is the piece I hope you take away that you have to create entry points outside of worship. Um, so I want you to take a couple of minutes and answer, do you have other entry points outside of your worship service for individuals? And if you don't, where are those opportunities? Do you have other entry points outside of worship? And if you do not, where are those opportunities? So take a couple of minutes, discuss that among yourselves, and then we'll come back together.
May the Lord be with you. I can't state enough how important that conversation is um, as you're seeking to connect with young people. So this is one where I really hope you will continue the conversation because it will make a tremendous impact if you're seeking to do things outside of your worship service and not simply using your worship service as the only point of entry for individuals. Uh, let's move on to thou shall learn how we roll. <laughs> as we think about, as we talked about yesterday, people are not joining as much. That means that you have less and less people who are actually going to become members of your congregation. More people are going to come and participate. Uh, let's go to the next one, please, for, that's for how we roll. Um, more people are going to participate, but they're not actually going to become members. But that does not mean that we cannot do the work of formation and helping them become disciples if they are participating with us, even if they don't become members. That's critically important. The second piece of that is when we do have people who actually do show up at our congregation, for those churches that are extremely friendly, let's be careful that we're not too friendly and we overwhelm people when they come. You don't want someone to come and you offer them to be the board, the chair of the trustees <laughs> on their first visit to the church. You know, we got to take it a little bit slower than that. So, so there's a happy medium in there someplace that is critically important. Let's go to uh, Thou Shall Watch the Throne. Um, Oftentimes, we tell young people that their day will come, and we push off to the future when they will be able to actively participate and assume, assume leadership. It's critically important that we understand that young people are gifted and can be leaders right now, that we don't need to wait for a future date for them to become leaders, but we need to integrate them right now in terms of leadership. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Yeah. One of the challenges of the reason we are in the mess we are in now is they have found other places to use their gifts, right? It's, you know, so they have the gifts and they're going to use them. The question is, are we going to be open to them using the gifts in the church or are they going to have to go elsewhere to use their gifts? So we want them to use their gifts in the church. Let's go on to Thou Shall Get Game. I'm running out of time, so I'm having to skip ahead a little bit. Um, congregations suffer from a failure of nerve. And some of you may be familiar with this. If you're not, great book. Edwin Friedman, Failure of Nerve, um, I would say is an absolute must read if you have not read it. We often fail because we're afraid of failing, and we can't be afraid of failing. We have to be willing, going back to Caleb and Joshua, to actually take the risk that we can move forward. And in moving forward, wonderful things can happen. The second piece of this is oftentimes we want comfort instead of being uncomfortable and moving out of our comfort zone. Um, and this happened again with the 10 versus the two. There, there was a, a fear of moving out of their comfort zone. So they wanted to stay inside of their comfort zone. We can't be afraid of moving outside of our comfort zones. It may not always work out for us, but that's okay. Failure is not a bad thing. Failure is something we can learn from. And that's what's critically important. Let us move to Thou shalt not deny my swag, the Eighth Commandment. <laughs> swag is the way that we carry ourselves. Um, David 
is a great example of someone who had swag. Here's this young lad who's walking around trying to figure out why everybody else is afraid to face the giant. And he's confused of why no one will stand up to the giant. And we could say that he was cocky, but I would prefer to think that David really just couldn't understand why people didn't trust in God to face the giant. We all have giants in our life that we have to face. We have to carry ourselves with the swag like David. David had that swag. The other piece of this I think that is important is David had no experience that would prepare him to face Goliath. Oftentimes we tell young people, well, you don't have the experience to do what is necessary. That can be a good thing actually, right? Because sometimes you don't know any better and you're willing to try different things. Sometimes when we have experience, we immediately think, well, that didn't work before, that failed before, so I'm not gonna try something. So sometimes a fresh approach is a good thing. So we shouldn't immediately just say something's not gonna work just because we don't have experience. All right, they're counting me down really quickly now, so let me move to um, the ninth commandment, thou shall sample. Here, I just want to comment on the Back to Egypt Committee. Yes, the Back to Egypt Committee. The Back to Egypt Committee is going to undermine all of your good efforts, right? You have to make sure that instead of listening to the Back to Egypt Committee, you're remembering the covenant. Joshua and Caleb reminded the Israelites they had made a covenant with God and the covenant with God was based on relationship, and that relationship is what is critical. We're called to a covenant of relationship, not a covenant of going back to Egypt. So the Back to Egypt Committee is going to take you backwards and not help you to live into the future that God has for you. Um, I'm running out of time, but I want to make sure that before they kick me off stage here in about 30 seconds, <laughs> that I show appreciation to, for the bishop for inviting me. Thank you all and for all of you for all of your wonderful hospitality. It has been wonderful to be with you all for these three days. And it is not true that someone cannot come back home. So I, I appreciate being able to come back home. Oh, no, it's okay. You give me a couple more minutes? All right. All right, they're giving me a couple more minutes. That's good. Introduce number 10. Yeah, okay. They want me to introduce the 10th commandment. The 10th commandment is thou shall represent. And here, what is critically important, it's coming from Jeremiah, is we're called right now to live out our future. Um, and by that, it means that we have an opportunity right now to make a difference in the lives of young people. And tokenism is not enough. It's not enough just to, to say we have some representative for all the young people. We need to fully integrate young people and be intergenerational. It was wonderful to see the praise band up here that was truly intergenerational, right? So we want to make sure that what we're doing is intergenerational and not simply tokenism. And I'll see if I can say one more word, Bishop, before I go. One of the challenges I think we face with intergenerational ministry is we have set up a system where we have separated when people, young people are in the church, we have actually pulled them out of worship. They'll go into children's church, then they'll go into young adult ministry, then when they go to college, they may not actually go into worship. So by the time they graduate from college, there are individuals who literally could be a part of the church but never really have sat through a worship experience. I think we're doing a disservice, again, when we're not fully integrating people intergenerationally in the work that we're doing. So let's keep that in mind. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. have we not been blessed by this teaching, amen?
Dr. Poe has done a marvelous job trying to work within the time frame that um, we have provided. And I want to say thank him. I want to thank him for his graciousness. Amen? Amen. And I just pray that what you have heard and learned this day is edifying and it's also encouraging and dare I even say convicting. Amen. I had promised the person who had come to microphone number five that immediately following our vision segment, I will give you a moment um, for privilege. Um, thank you, Bishop, but I will abstain for this time. Thank you. I'm sorry? I said thank you, but I'll hold off for now. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you for your graciousness. Amen. Okay, friends, um, please prepare to hear the results of ballot number six. And I will be sharing the results of the laity ballot first. There was no election. Number of ballots cast, 615. Number of valid ballots, 580. The number needed for election, an election, was 291. Here are the results. Thomas Lewis, 281. Donald Birdsall, 277. Susan Ogberger, 249. Lucinda Starr, 244. William Watts, 196. Richard Quarter, 190. Alan Lafferty, 180. Kathy Palmer, 169. Kimberly Green, 77. Blair Porter, 73. Brian Sheets, 41. Tom Abraham, 39. Richard Sammartino, 39. Clark Sprang, 39. If we can please put those results on the screen. Give us a moment. I see Rick Walcott our director of communications making his way back to provide some assistance. What I am going to do, we will get those on the screen. I am going to share the clergy ballot, and then when they're ready to go up on this, are we ready? Praise the Lord. <laughs> okay. I've already shared that information. If you can please show the names. We're showing them at the same pace we've been showing them before.
Okay. So friends, let us now hear the report on ballot number six for the clergy. There was no election. Number of ballots cast, 313. Number of valid ballots, 309. Number needed for election, 155. Hear the report. Susan Brown, 131. Clinton L. Quillen, Jr., 113. We will proceed now with ballot number seven. Cindy will give us instructions. As we move on to ballot number seven, um, we will collect the lay ballots first. Uh, we didn't have very many invalid ballots, but remember, stay within the range and pay attention to the numbers that are on the screen that have already been uh, elected. Laity will be voting, this will be ballot number seven, you will be voting for seven persons. No, it's ballot seven, you're voting for four persons. <laughs> Just making sure you're paying attention. I didn't want you to fall asleep on me, okay? Four persons for the lay ballot, please. Your ballot code is praise, and the teller group will be A. When we move on to the clergy, it will also be ballot number seven, and you will be voting for one person. And your ballot code is God. Clergy teller group will be A. So the lay ballot code is praise, P-R-A-I-S-E, and the clergy ballot code is God, G-O-D. I have not opened the ballot yet. We're going to have prayer. We have just received instructions. Stan Rickers will offer a word of prayer at microphone number four. Let us pray. In times of turmoil, the Lord said to the psalmist, be still and know that I am God. Be still, be calm, be silent. Be at peace and know, be sure, be certain that I, the one and only, the Holy Living Spirit, am God, the everlasting Father, the Supreme Being. Be still and know that I am God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Stan. Ballot number seven is open. We are in the middle of a ballot, and so unless there's a question about the process, it is a question about the process, microphone number six. If we can all please pay attention just for a moment. Philip Wilden, Mid-Ohio District. When the clergy results were listed, there were only two names. Did no one else receive the minimum number required to name them? That would be correct. I only read the names that receive that minimum. Thank you. And the minimum is 25. Thank you for the question of clarity. You may proceed. And remember, laity, when you're prepared, only laity should be standing. When you're prepared to have your ballot collected, only laity should be standing. And I ask that there be no other movement in the house except for that of the tellers at this time.
We are moving along very well, friends. When your ballot is complete, please stand so it can be collected. Anyone needing more time, if you'll raise your hand so that way I can make sure that a teller can come near to where you are so I can get a sense of the house. If you need more time, if you'll please raise your hand. I see other tellers coming toward the front. How I am gauging our readiness is when I see no tellers on the floor. Okay. So it looks like all ballots have been collected for the laity? No. No? One in the back. One in the back. Okay, I see. Thank you. All right. The ballot is ready, just need to be collected. Thank you. Okay. The last ballot has just been collected. So ballot number seven for the laity is closed. Clergy, if you are ready, have your ballots completed, you can begin standing. They're gonna get a long break after. They're gonna get a long break after this one. So clergy, if your ballots are completed, 
you should be standing. If you need more time, can you please wave your hand so I get a sense? Okay, I see a hand over here. Anyone else need more time? If I can have a teller go and stand over here, wave your hand again so I can get a teller over to you. Okay, I see, okay, one here. Anyone else needing more time other than over here? Any other outstanding ballots before I declare ballot number seven closed for the clergy? Okay, I'm not seeing any movement. So ballot number seven for the clergy is now closed. Let me recognize microphone number six. Mid Ohio, chair of the, uh, the Board of, Current of uh, Trustees for the past three years. Bishop, I was wondering if I could make a motion to referral. Okay. I would move that the Conference Council of Finance and Administration and the Board of Trustees jointly study the allocation of 10% of all proceeds for the future sales of property bequests lease and our occasional revenue for the purpose of the Bishop's Appeal for Student Housing at Africa University. A special fund would be established and dispersed for the general purpose of funding student housing project at the African University. The CCFA and the Conference Board of Trustees to report to the 2020 Annual Conference for their recommendations, changes to the conference policy, and additional actions necessary for the implementation of the, to the Annual Conference. Okay, that is a motion before the House. Is there a second? Thank you. I'll give you a moment to speak to it. Having heard the Bishop Malone's Episcopal Address on Monday afternoon, and led by the Holy Spirit, we, the East Ohio Annual Conference, should find a way to fund housing for women's dormitories at the African University in Zimbabwe. East Ohio has a long tradition of partnership and support with the African University, and I believe we should respond positively to the Bishop's Appeal. As the conference trustees chair, I help facilitate the process of sales of closed churches property. For example, in 2018, we sold the Brewster United Methodist Church for an amount of $172,758, the West Mecca United Methodist Church for an amount of $91,451. We set aside revenue for the sale, from the sales of this church property, leases, and bequests for future ministries within the conference, most notably congregational development. We have accumulated funds for future ministry from property sales in which we, use, we are well positioned to respond to the bishop's appeal. I ask the conference to support the Bishop's Appeal and this mission endeavor. Okay, friends, we have that motion before the House. It's been seconded, and we've had one speech for. The floor is open for any discussion. We allow for three speeches for, three speeches against. We've already had one speech for. I'm not seeing anyone move to any mic, so I'm going to invite you to get your voting cards ready. Again, this is a microphone number six. Yes, uh, Reverend Craig Moak, Rural Chapel United Methodist Church from the great mid-Ohio district. Uh, I almost just asked Alan the question since I know Alan and he's right here. Uh, the question I wanted to verify is this is only for the sale of churches that are closing, not for the sale of property in any other uh, part of the life of the church. Is that correct? Correct. Alan said yes. correct. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, friends, um, if you will get your um, voting cards ready, you have the motion for referral before you. For those of you who support this motion, who are in favor of this motion, raise your card. 
Amen. Those of you who are not in favor of this motion, show by the same sign. The motion carries. To buy, be the glory. Amen. Let me recognize microphone number six. Thank you. Amy Barr, Mid-Ohio District. I would request a moment of personal privilege. You may proceed. While I appreciate that we're talking about how to reach younger people in our churches, I as a millennial did not identify with many of the points that were made during our visioning session. As the youth have been pointing out repeatedly during this conference, they are here. They are asking for representation. Why are we not asking our young people to tell us their needs and their desires rather than making assumptions based on which boxes their generations check? Thank you. We receive your words. Amen. Okay, let me see where we are. Because we have an order of the day I'm trying to keep us faithful to and I want to be able to give you a break. And it looks like we're gonna have to go ahead and um, take our break now. Um, so friends, we are going to be in a 10 minute, 10 minute break. The time is now um, 10.58. I do ask that we please be in our places. Um, we will be welcoming, I, I didn't put us in recess yet, please. We're not in recess, I'm asking if we can please be still. We have our Vacation Bible School children who will be coming to lead us and we want to be in our places when they arrive. So if we can please be in our places at 11.05, thank you.
Friends, if we can begin to settle ourselves, our children have arrived and they are getting themselves settled on stage behind the curtains. We want to be in our places when those curtains open. So can we please make our way to our seats so we can receive our children? Friends, if we can please make our way to our places. We are doing a great job keeping with schedule and being cooperative with our time frames around our breaks. We're doing well. We're in the home stretch. Let's hold out. We can do this. If we can please quiet the house. If we can please quiet the house. We can make our way to our seats. Thank you so much for your cooperation. We are ready to receive our Vacation Bible School children of the East Ohio Conference.
On behalf of Vacation Bible School, we thank you. We had a, anywhere between 92 to 98 students, about 22 youth and 10 adults um, working together to bring you Coastberry material. And we thank you for supporting us and believing us. I have special thanks this year to Steve Court, Courtney Gould, and um, Susan Arnold from the conference office that were a big help for me. We thank you, we hope that you um, really enjoyed and heard their words. Um, realized they started this on Monday. I didn't know all the words, but they did, so that's good. And um, 
We hope to see you all next year. We always are looking for helpers, um, particularly adult helpers, but also youth. Um, life happens and things change. So if you are interested in helping, please see me sometime. And uh, parents, please don't pick your children up to 12 o'clock because we're heading back to finish up Vacation Bible School. Thank you and God bless. Friends, we are so very thankful to God for our children leading us in singing. Amen. Amen. Proverbs says, train a child up in thy word and they will not divert from thy path. Amen. We want to say a special thank you to Tony McGee for her leadership and for all of the staff. Amen. Thank you for your beautiful leadership, your beautiful ministry, your ministry of love. We see all of your passion. Thank you on behalf of the East Ohio Conference for all that you continue to do to bless our children and to bless our lives. Amen. We are so blessed. <laughs> Amen. So as our children began to make their way back, we are going to reconvene. We are so blessed, aren't we? To have so many um, leaders who are working with our children and, and especially for our parents who are here in session to know that your children are in a safe place, in a loving place, and they are learning about the ways and the love of Jesus. Amen. What a gift. At this time, we are going to begin our next session as we continue our work together this morning. We're going to begin with the word of prayer, and Bob Stahl is prepared.